Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Briz Science in September 2021. I am Joel Gilmore, your host for this evening, and this is Briz Science, Brisbane's free public lecture series on science, where we aim to bring not just the best scientists, but also the best communicators to share their research and their love of science with the Brisbane community, and now, of course, the whole world. Uh, Briz Science is hosted by the University of Queensland, and we thank them always for their support. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting tonight and pay my respect to elders, both past and present. Now, we are on Zoom tonight. So when the time comes to ask questions, we are going to take them in two ways. One is over the Q&A feature in, through the Zoom chat. And you can just type your question in there and we'll get to it as quickly as possible. The other is over Twitter. So if you want to tweet us questions, you can use the hashtag BrizScience and we will pick up those questions as well. So there'll be some time for those questions at the end of the evening. Now, we are, of course, I should say, we had hoped to be uh, back in person last month, but obviously uh, it was a brief lockdown. And so Briz Science is going to continue to be in something of a, uh, a superposition of states, online and offline, um, as we try and figure out exactly when we come back in person. But next month, we're going to be still online. And that superposition will continue. A little bit like New South Wales has been in a superposition of lockdown, but not actually lockdown. And this is also quite a nice segue, talking about superpositions, you see, to our talk this evening because tonight we're going to talk about the weirdness of quantum mechanics. And who better to talk us through that than Dr. Fabio Costa from the University of Queensland, where he works on, well, you say, the, the, the fundamental nature of reality, right? the time and causality and quantum mechanics. Uh, he is not just a brilliant scientist, although he is that as well, but he's also the 2021 Queensland Young Tall Poppy Science Award winner. So we're very lucky to have him to here tonight. So get your questions ready and uh, get your thinking caps on because there might be some questions from Costa, uh, from Fabio, sorry, during this evening. So please put your virtual hands together and welcome Dr. Fabio Costa. Well, thank you, Joel, and uh, <clears throat> welcome everybody. So I hope you're all uh, comfortable at home or uh, wherever you're uh, listening to me. Um, and I hope uh, this will be a pleasant evening. So I will start by sharing my screen. I have some uh, uh, slides that I want to show you. Okay, so tonight uh, um, I would like to talk, uh, talk to you a little about uh, um, some part of my work, um, as Joel said, on quantum weirdness. Um, now, um, when I was preparing this presentation, I was thinking, so uh, what actually do people uh, uh, think about uh, uh, when they hear the word quantum? So uh, I've been in this business for quite a while. So for me, it means certain things. And uh, I know that uh, uh, it's been going around quite a lot in the, in the past few years. Uh, and so what I did was uh, I jump as we do these days on, uh, on Google search and uh, well, um, if you search for quantum, you you always find some uh, some weird uh, artsy, uh, sciencey things, but not very clear what's going on. Uh, there is well, the first picture is actually uh, the one that makes sense. It's uh, atoms, so that has to do with the quantum. But all the rest is uh, uh, a lot of artsy stuff. Very very nice to to look at, but not really clear what's going on. Uh, and so um, I thought maybe. I can take the occasion to uh, a little uh, talk about um, uh, uh, quantum. So that will be the first part of the title will uh, take most of the time. Um, but before starting, I thought maybe uh, I can ask the audience uh, instead of uh, uh, just relying on Google search, uh, I can ask the audience, uh, what do you associate the quantum with? So uh, if you feel like you can uh, go and click the, uh, the chat um, option. And if you want to write a word or a couple of words uh, that maybe it's uh, what you heard, uh, um, in what context did you hear about quantum mechanics or what do you think uh, it relates to? So while well, there are a few small stuff, okay, that's uh, it's very good. The quantity of something, that's very nice. So yes, the answers start to come through. Quantum leap, 
the thing that lie between or that's beneath the matter superposition how the world works below the atomic level philosophically contradictory the science of the very small okay so we have a few recurring themes that come up spin a cat in a box okay that's what i was waiting for there is always something to do with the cat when we talk about quantum mechanics counter logic so um, there is probability okay that's very good definitely quantum mechanics has to do with that um yeah, if anybody has, uh, so this is just a very short uh, uh, overview. Uh, interesting, uh, uh, crazy small stuff in steps, stuff beyond my understanding. Okay, we'll try, try to bring this stuff a bit closer to uh, everybody's understanding tonight. Um, so maybe I will, uh, I will stop it there. You can keep uh, posting things. Uh, interesting, nobody wrote to things like computers, which I thought would be the most popular quantum thing these days, because, uh, well, uh, Australia and a lot of countries in the world are... Uh, spending a lot on, of money on computers, on quantum computers. Um, uh, but yeah, so it seems that uh, most people coming here uh, are really interested in the, uh, in the more science part more than in the technology part. And that's actually what I want to talk about. Feynman, well, that's nice, okay. Um, all right, so um, before we get into that, uh, maybe, I can introduce myself. So um, my name is Fabio Costa, as you heard, and I work at the University of Queensland. So where do I come from? From my voice, well, apart the fact that it's a little broken tonight, but you can uh, as, uh, you can understand that I'm not native to Australia. Um, so uh, I come from, uh, if we look from uh, a world perspective, from the point of view of Australia, I come from that uh, little square uh, over there. Uh, if we want to be a bit more precise, I spent my first few years in Milan, which is famous for its cathedral and its breaded meat. And there I did my undergraduate studies. Uh, and in 2008, I moved to Vienna, which is famous of course for its cathedral and its breaded meat. Um, well then uh, after 2014, uh, I was a bit tired of cathedrals and breaded meat and uh, I moved to Brisbane. And I've been working here uh, um, ever since. Um, and so what have I been doing? So uh, I've been doing uh, all this time. So as I said, I was doing my undergraduate studies uh, in Milan and in Vienna I was doing my doctoral studies, so my PhD. And uh, um, well, if, we, if I want to say uh, what my work is about, maybe I can quote a little movie clip. Do you guys just put the word quantum in front of everything? So that's pretty much what my work is about. It's uh, uh, putting the word quantum in front of stuff. And uh, if, you, if you go through the, uh, the titles of works that have been published by me and colleagues, uh, you will find the quantum computers, quantum simulation, quantum cryptography, quantum entanglement, quantum reference frame, quantum space-time, quantum causal structure, all kinds of things you can imagine. We just try to shove the word quantum in front of them. Uh, so then, <clears throat> of course, uh, uh, the obvious question is, what is quantum? What is it all about? Um, now, the word itself is simple to explain. Uh, quantum means the smallest quantity. So if you think that you have some amount of stuff, for example, you have sand, uh, the smallest quantity of sand, it's a grain of sand. Uh, and the idea of quantum uh, things is that uh, things in nature are not um, just uh, divisible uh, forever, but they're made of, uh, of uh, uh, smallest quantities. And we can best uh, um, describe this uh, uh, using the example of light. So take a, a simple uh, uh, torch light and shine it on a screen. You will see a nice uh, spot of light. And of course you can imagine to dim this light. You can make it dimmer and you can make it dimmer and you can make it dimmer. And one would think uh, uh, that you can always make it dimmer, that you can always have a little less light without switching off completely. But it turns out this is not true. At some point, you cannot make it dimmer anymore. And at some point, you will just start to see uh, individual spots of light uh, of a fixed uh, brightness appearing on the screen. So you will see a spot of light, a spot of light, a spot of light. And uh, <clears throat> that is what we call the quantum of light, or uh, also the photon. So that's uh, to say that uh, um, light doesn't come in, uh, um, cannot be uh, at, at, at an arbitrary brightness, but uh, there are uh, some smallest uh, uh, individual packets of light. Mm -hmm. And by the way, do you know how we know that uh, uh, this is a, a, a photon? 
it's because it's traveling, traveling light. Um, yeah, it's, it's luggage. Okay, so, um, right, so, so that's the idea of the word quantum, the smallest quantity. Now, this is not really new, and uh, by itself, maybe it's not so weird. So uh, ancient Greeks uh, thought about it. That they thought that things are made up of atoms. Now, atoms, we know, are not indivisible, but uh, the idea that things are made up of granular stuff is not that new. So to get a little more into uh, what actually quantum is about, I will start to introduce some, uh, some experiment, very, very simple one. Um, so the experiment uh, uses a beam splitter. Um, a beam splitter is uh, something very simple. It's uh, a half reflecting mirror. So if you sh shine a light on the beam splitter, half of it will go through and half of it uh, uh, will be reflected. But now what happens if, uh, uh, if we dim the light enough to go to the single photon level? So a photon arrives at the beam splitter, what will it do? It, it's the small quantity of light, so it cannot break up and go half up, half down. So what we'll do, uh, if we put the screen uh, as before, what we'll see is, do is that sometimes we see the spot appearing up and sometimes we see the spot appearing down. And uh, uh, the, the crucial thing here is that uh, there is no way to tell when it will appear uh, up and when down. All we'll be able to tell is that uh, there will be some probability to be up and some to be down. So if we have a uh, balanced, uh, uh, being splitter that will be half of the time will appear up and half of the time will appear down but there is no way to tell uh, uh, the individual spot uh, where it will be so if we try to make a picture so we we were uh, talking about these photons so we try to make a picture of what's going on it's a bit uh, like uh, we have these photons and uh, sometimes they say oh uh, tonight i feel like i will go this way i will reflect off the mirror uh, and some other time the photon says, well, no, I, today I prefer to be transmitted. So this is a little annoying for physicists because we really like uh, uh, to, to uh, have things under control. We, we like to think that nature is made up of, uh, of uh, is run by laws and we can always in principle tell uh, how things are going to be. Uh, and it seems that this uh, very, very simple experiment is actually, uh, it doesn't agree with this. It says, uh, uh, no, there is no way. The photon just uh, uh, has its own mind and will decide when to go up and when to go down. Okay, so this is a little strange, <clears throat> but however, that's not really uh, yet uh, to the, uh, the core of it. And so to get to the core of it, I will introduce a slightly more complicated experiment and it's nothing really mind blogging. So we take two beam splitters, they work exactly like the one I've shown before. And I will, we, we also take two mirrors so these are just fully reflective mirrors. And uh, what this arrangement does, which is called interferometer, it's simply when you shine a light, uh, the first beam splitter splits the beam in two and the purpose of the two mirrors is to bring the two beams back together. And now of course the question is, uh, what happens if we dim the light again and we go to the single photon? Uh, so now we have the single photon and uh, we know that each beam splitter can uh, uh, with some probability can send it up or down one way or the other way. And uh, so now uh, I can put to you a question. I will give you three uh, options. So we will not use the chat now. Um, so let me first uh, uh, read, the, read the possibilities and then we can pull up uh, a poll. So we can, uh, I can give you three options. So, so one is that the, uh, so, so the question here is uh, where on the end screen will the uh, photon end up? So it can be up or down. And the three possibilities that uh, will always go either up or down so that each photon will definitely know where to go and will be always up or will be always down. Or the other option is that as with the previous B splitter will be either up or down with equal probability. And I also give a third option that maybe something new and completely unexpected might happen. So uh, we can uh, run a poll now. So if we can uh, uh, set the poll. And I guess we'll have uh, around a minute uh, to, uh, to, to get through the poll. So the answers are going through. Um, so I assume there are some, uh, <coughs> there might be some physicists in the audience. So the physicists might know the answer, although uh, to be fair, um, the answer is not really uh, unique, but there is one answer that I, 
uh, that I will claim is the right one. So we have uh, um, 73 answers in. <coughs> Apologies, so I will take just a moment of break, waiting for the polls to come in. Okay, so interesting that uh, most of the people <coughs> went with the something new and completely unexpected. So that's how, uh, well, definitely uh, we quantum physicists uh, have been able to sell uh, uh, quantum stuff as really weird. So that's what everybody thinks is going to be. Actually, the answer is uh, uh, the one that has been uh, the least uh, um, selected and it's uh, definitely up or definitely down. Now, to be fair, uh, this really matches with the, uh, with the last one because this is really weird. And uh, why is it weird? Because, uh, well, if you consider the picture we had before that each bin splitter, at each bin splitter, the photon has to decide to go up or down. And then at the next bin splitter, we'll decide again to go either up or down. Well, uh, we will really expect that uh, after the second bin splitter, it will just either go up or down with equal probability. But that's not what, what happens. Uh, now, to be fair, uh, this really depends on how you set up the interferometer, but it is possible to set it up exactly as I'm saying, to, to have all the photons after the second beam splitter to go always up. And now this is really the weird thing, that's really insane. So if, how, how does the photon know that they have to go always up? And so that's, uh, that's why we, uh, we like to say that quantum mechanics really uh, plays with our, uh, um, our notion of reality. So. Uh, so what happens is that uh, after the first, first beam splitter, if we try to, uh, to describe the state of the photon, then uh, we cannot really say that it's either up or down uh, because if it was either up or down, then uh, say if it was up, then when it arrives the uh, second beam splitter, we'll again have to choose uh, with 50-50. So, uh, so this uh, uh, interferometer, uh, rules out the possibility that the photon, uh, what is doing is either uh, traveling up or traveling down. So that's not what's happening. But so maybe it's up and down. So uh, we hear this a lot, the cat is dead and alive and all these kind of things. But that's not quite right because uh, if we measure the photon the first time, we will either see it up or we will see it down. We will never see two photons or a photon up and down. That doesn't actually make sense. So what's happening? Well, uh, physicists uh, write it like this, up plus down. And what does uh, this plus mean? It's not your <coughs> ordinary plus where you sum up the number, that's what it's called a superposition. And essentially it's uh, just a way to say, well, you know, this is just a quantum thing. Uh, we don't really have uh, any uh, ordinary intuition uh, way to say um, what is going on. Uh, so in a way there is really a new uh, kind of reality that is not this or that, it's not this and that, it's this superposition that, which, um, yeah, that's something that it's really hard to describe in other terms. Um, now to, um, so uh, that's probably, um, perhaps this should be as much as we should say about quantum superposition, but I would like to offer you a little extra thing if, if you like to watch it. So that's the most uh, uh, math that there will be in these slides because there is both the sign plus and the sign minus. So essentially a way we can uh, describe what is going on is that we have different possibilities like the photon reflected, the photon uh, transmitted. And uh, when they're in superposition, then uh, they can sub sum up with the plus or with the minus. So here we have these four possibility. So reflect, reflect, or reflect, transmit, 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 reflect. And if you do the math, what turns out that there is one minus sign here. And so when there is a, because here we have a plus and here we have a minus. So this is, these are the two options for the photon going down. And so, because one is with the plus and the other with the minus, they cancel. So that's one, uh, like when you do one plus one and minus one, uh, you didn't do anything. And so what happens are just these possibilities, these two possibilities with the photon going up. Um, and so, well, that's actually not really a metaphor. That's really how the math works. And uh, it's just, um, so we really know how to do this math. And if you're a quantum physicist, uh, all your life is uh, spent about figuring out this plus and minus thing. Um, but really, it's really still an open question to interpret uh, all this weirdness. 
Okay, so uh, that's uh, that's uh, about the quantum weirdness, and uh, that uh, can be used to do a lot of wonderful stuff. For example, you can do better computers because if you imagine this is a computation, this is another computation, if all these possibilities are computation and maybe up is the right answer, you can see that uh, um, because the wrong answer cancels out, you can get the, the uh, right answer having only one go. While if you had to explore all these possibilities uh, with classical uh, uh, light, you will have to do it four times. Um, and there are a lot of wonderful things you can do with quantum. And so um, essentially what we find is that uh, um, uh, classically, so classically is what we call the things that are not quantum. If you have two options, if things can be this way and that way, then we can also uh, have them in superposition. And so people have a word about figuring out superposition for all kinds of things. And my work uh, now for the last five minutes, I will talk about uh, my work has been uh, uh, essentially uh, to try to see what other things can we put in superposition. And so that's exactly uh, the thing we were trying to do to put the word quantum in front of everything. So to, uh, and that's both for, to understand the nature of reality better, but also to see if putting new things in superposition can uh, uh, get more uh, um, technological applications. And so what we were trying to do for most of the time, what I was trying to do was to talk about temporal order. So for example, uh, in ordinary life, you can decide, first I will read a, a book about quantum physics so that I go prepared to breathe science and I will know a bit more about that. Or maybe you can decide I will do the other way around. First I go to breathe science, I get inspired and later I will learn more about quantum physics. And now uh, when you do quantum things, uh, you can do a variation of this interferometer that if you have a, a, a yellow ball, it will do first book, then breathe science. If you have a green ball, it will go first breathe science and then book. But then if a ball can be green or yellow, you know, we can, can be in superposition of uh, uh, green and yellow, which means you can go uh, the two orders in superposition. Um, now this is uh, quite crazy, but not crazy enough uh, uh, for our uh, experimentalist friends who were actually able to do these uh, uh, experiments. And uh, uh, in fact, there are some uh, uh, technological applications of this idea of uh, putting this superposition, uh, uh, the order of events. Um, uh, but so, so the experiment works fine, but now if you try to uh, really work it out uh, and uh, make a consistent theory where uh, you try to uh, make the order event uh, as a quantum thing, you find that you have a problem. And the problem is that all physics, including quantum mechanics, usually assumes time. So assume that things evolve in time. So you will have at the first time uh, your system in some way, the second time the system in some other way, at the later time, it's yet another way. And even for quantum things, uh, that's how it works. You will say, uh, maybe uh, it starts uh, in, a, in your particle in a position, then uh, later it's a superposition of up and down, and then later is in uh, some particular place again. But you always have this uh, time um, setting up the, um, uh, you have some, some clock that tells you uh, when your state is. Um, and so, <clears throat> What we did is, uh, um, so my main work is to come around this problem. And so what I work with is a new approach, not only to quantum physics, but to physics in general. So I try to do physics in a way that doesn't require this time ordering. And to give you just a glimpse how this works, uh, instead of uh, <clears throat> describing things as evolving in time, we imagine uh, uh, that we have uh, some, uh, um, we can picturally think that we have some, uh, uh, laboratories where you can observe, observe uh, things happening and you can also interact with systems, but uh, your laboratories don't have clocks. Uh, you don't know when things are happening in the laboratory. And so uh, you have uh, uh, the experimenters in the laboratory can uh, see things happening, can see the, uh, the state one way, the state another way, but a priori, you don't know which one was going before and which one was the, uh, going later. And so in this way, you can actually uh, describe superposition of causal order. You can describe uh, uh, much crazier scenarios than uh, uh, the experiment I've, uh, uh, you have seen before. And uh, as a spin-off uh, to this research, something uh, we published last year, uh, you can actually talk about time traveling. Now time traveling per se doesn't necessarily have to do with quantum. Uh, we don't really know if it's possible, but now with this new approach, uh, we can actually at least describe time traveling, which is not possible if you're stuck with the, having to describe things evolving one time to the next time. 
Uh, and so uh, if you're interested in, uh, in, this, uh, in this story, you can Google my name and the time traveling. Uh, the, the story was very popular, so you, you can read some more. Um, and so that's about uh, all I had to say for tonight. So uh, thank you for your, your attention. I hope uh, you enjoyed the presentation. And now I think we'll be ready to take some questions. Thank you so much, Fabio. So I, I, I toured a force through quantum mechanics and time travel and causality. So now is your chance for everybody to ask some questions in the Q&A, anything you've ever wanted to know about um, quantum mechanics, causality, cats. And of course, we will be back next month so make sure you head to the Briz Science website, or Facebook page or Twitter mailing list, sign up and we will send out all the details. And then hopefully we'll be back in person in the not too distant future, if all goes well. All right. So we are starting to have a few questions come through here and on Twitter. So yeah, the first question here from Jan Fabio, who asks, how does this fit with entropy? Um, very interesting question. I assume uh, uh, all this is uh, uh, the, the last part about uh, uh, superposition of order uh, because the, the first part quantum fits quite well. There is a, a quantum notion of entropy and it's not too different to the classical one. But yes, so when you remove time, then uh, uh, it's actually not very clear what to do with entropy. So in principle, entropy is a measure of the uh, order of things. Eh? So uh, you can have things that are more ordered or less ordered. And this still makes sense even if there is no time. So you can have a, a, a one laboratory that looks say at the kangaroo and the other looks at the other kangaroo and they can decide which one is more ordered and which not. In that case, they look kind of the same, but you can imagine one of the pictures is much, much more messy. Uh, now, what we don't know is uh, how does the uh, arrow of time uh, fit, fits with, the, with this picture? Because the usual story is that uh, the arrow of time, so what uh, allow us to tell what comes before and what's later, is given by the increase of entropy. So we see things becoming more and more disordered, more messy, as time increases. But now if there is no time to, to start with, then it's not really clear uh, even a, in which direction to start to look. So this is actually a very interesting question. We are uh, working on it. Uh, my view is that actually it should be possible to recover uh, time altogether, uh, perhaps from uh, uh, looking at the uh, increase of entropy without even knowing about the time. So I, I have the different pictures. I don't know in which order they are, but I can order them a posteriori by seeing which one is more messy and which one is less messy. Okay. I got a question here from Jack who asks, what is the largest object that quantum mechanics applies to, like your light bouncing experiment? Uh, there is no known limit. So as far as you know, quantum mechanics ap applies to absolutely everything uh, in the world. Uh, the problem is that it's not so easy to create superposition states like, um, uh, like I was showing in the interferometer. And the reason is that superposition states are very fragile. If you, if you interact a little bit, then essentially will be destroyed. So the largest objects, uh, now if I'm, uh, uh, so the, the, the record for the large, largest objects that have been put in superposition is held by uh, the laboratory of Marcus Art in uh, Vienna. Uh, so they got very famous when they put uh, uh, bucky balls in superposition. So these are molecules made of 60 carbon atoms. Uh, they, they went much farther after that. So they went uh, above 10,000 uh, atomic un units. So that's, I think they probably went a little farther after that, but um, that's more or less where we're sitting now. Uh, around the, Objects that are as heavy as uh, 10,000 atoms can go through an interferometer as the one that I'm shown. But really, it is a matter of uh, technology and not of principle, as far as we know. <clears throat> yeah, interesting stuff. Very deep questions coming through here. Um, Anonymous asks, can you comment on quantum effects in nature, for example, in chlorophyll? Uh, right. So. I think this uh, uh, refers to some uh, uh, work that has been done uh, trying to see if um, some natural phenomena has uh, 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 preeminently quantum uh, features. So um, 
there are split opinions on that. So there are there is quite a lot of work, but I don't think there is a really a final uh, decision. Now the, the point is uh, uh, really everything we see around is quantum. There isn't anything that uh, is not explained by quantum mechanics. If you want to uh, explain why objects hold their shape, for example, and don't just fly around in million bits, uh, you need quantum mechanics. Uh, if you want to explain uh, uh, things like stars, like the sun, how it burns, you need quantum mechanics. So, and, and if you want to uh, uh, explain uh, photosynthesis, you really need quantum mechanics. However, you don't need uh, uh, specifically to refer to uh, the weirdest part of quantum mechanics, like superposition, as I was saying. And so there are some works that suggest maybe um, actually you do need it, that uh, when uh, uh, a photon hits a part of, a, of, the, of the leaf and then its energy is transported to other part of the leaf, it's so efficient because it goes in a superposition of different parts, uh, the, the jury is still out. There are some works that suggest that and other works that say that's actually not what's going on. Thanks. And this is all very, um, uh, I, I, it's either good or bad for me because that was very much my PhD uh, topic, Fabio, looking at quantum mechanics right. and biological systems. So, you know, bringing back some memories, the good and right. the bad of being a PhD student. Um, okay, got a question from Brian. Given that it's impossible to deal with a single photon, is the interferometer experiment a real one or is that entirely theoretical? Oh no, it's absolutely real, and it's completely possible to do with single deal with single photons. That's what people have been doing for uh, for many years. People in Brisbane are really masters of that. So there is a thing that is called quantum optics, and what it means is so optics is uh, playing with light, and quantum optics is playing with light but using single photons. So it's absolutely possible, and uh, these are actually the experiments I've shown. It's real. It's been done. I've been in the lab doing it. And it's quite simple. You put a PhD student with a little bit of supervision and it will do it in, in a matter of weeks. Great stuff. Um, okay, we've got a few different questions here, which I'm going to sort of join together, which is asking about, I think, interpreting quantum mechanics. So can the observer influence quantum mechanics? Um, consciousness? And question, what is your interpretation of quantum mechanics? If everything is quantum, do you believe in the many worlds theory of quantum mechanics? So would you be able to talk a little bit about that big picture stuff? Right, so, so I was mentioning before that uh, uh, the interpretation of quantum mechanics is still uh, something um, scientists didn't agree on. Now to be absolutely clear, we are talking about uh, interpretation, uh, which uh, in my view, this is a way to talk about things. So if there was a very good interpretation of quantum mechanics, I will be able to go a little beyond uh, those lights I've shown and give you some very convincing way to interpret what's going on. Uh, it's not about the math. And uh, in my view, it's even not about the science. So the, the math is very clear and the physics, I will say is not ambiguous. So it doesn't really need an interpretation. We don't need an interpretation to, uh, to talk about quantum mechanics, to do the experiments, to in a way um, work with it. Um, and so in a way, uh, I, I guess I call myself a little of a, an agnostic. I don't believe that we really need to, uh, to stick to one interpretation or the other. Different interpretations have their value <clears throat> in bringing some features more prominently uh, to light. So for example, the many word interpretations is one where uh, uh, tries to insist that uh, the question, where is the photon? Uh, the answer is actually it's up and down. It tries to put this end. Uh, I have a, so some aspects uh, are interesting in many words because you can get some intuition right. However, it really is, uh, is too heavy. There are all these words that we can never see, we can never access. And you don't really need to talk about these words uh, uh, when you talk about quantum mechanics. And there are also a lot of issues. Uh, other things uh, uh, related to the uh, consciousness and the observer, that's really, uh, in some interpretations, these things play a, a bigger role than in others. So I will say consciousness really um, is not something that uh, uh, you don't need to understand consciousness in the way that a psychiatrist do, does uh, to understand quantum mechanics. So I will say that's not really as close to quantum mechanics as sometimes is portrayed. And in terms of the observer, that again, uh, so there is a common uh, uh, thing that people will say is that when you make a quantum measure that destroys the quantum state. So when the photon is in a superposition of up and down, you measure it and then it's definitely up or down and that somehow suggests that uh, um, 
the act of measurement of knowing something uh, really um, changes uh, uh, the state of, uh, of the matter. And now that's also not necessary because if you, if you look a bit more in detail, when you talk about the measurement, you actually need to talk about the measuring device. And so what influences the, the quantum state is the device and not your state of knowledge. So um, yeah, that's my take on, uh, on those topics. <clears throat> Um, Sorry, I was on mute there. Lots for everybody to think through there. I think we'll do one more question. Um, we've got a question here from John, who asks, I've read a piece about your time travel research that if you went back and stopped patient zero getting COVID, it would happen anyway. Can you explain this? Yeah, so this is a little off topic, but uh, okay. Um, so um, yeah, that's sometimes... <clears throat> um, popular representation of our research is not always accurate. Uh, so the point there is more that uh, if you went back and tried to stop patient zero, and maybe you think you succeeded because uh, you, you thought you knew the circumstances, the outbreak began and you went to someone and took them from, from where, you, uh, where they got infected to somewhere else, um, the pandemic will, uh, will uh, start again, but with the same patient zero. So the, the key here is that uh, um, we don't actually know who is patient zero. So you go back, you try to do something, uh, but whatever you do actually mm, are the actions that uh, set in motion uh, the events that we see today. So, um, well, I shouldn't uh, spend too much time because this is uh, a whole different line of research, but the key there is that in principle, time traveling is possible and it's possible to influence the past, uh, but it's not possible to change the past in the sense I can go back and uh, 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 tell someone to get uh, um, on some red shoes or blue shoes, but they cannot change the fact that they got red shoes or, or blue shoes. So if, if that's what happened and we know today that's what happened yesterday, that cannot be changed. I can participate in the story when tr I travel back in time and everything ends up being logically consistent, which is very difficult to grapple with. And that's why we need this uh, different formalism, um, but you cannot actually change the past according to our model. Okay, well, uh, we should give you one more question, which is, um, you know, what's the next big thing? Let's say that uh, the Fabio of the future comes back, tells you the lottery numbers, you're a very successful winner in the next lottery. Um, what is your, what, what, what would you be doing? What's the big experiment you've always wanted to do? Oh, okay. So this is not a time traveling question. Is uh, no, no. This is this is a Fabio Costa question. You know, what what would be if you got all the money you needed? What would you love to do? Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Um, well, I, I think I would really like to do something with gravity, which is something I, I didn't talk about, but it's part of the motivation of this research because if you try to put together gravity and quantum, you get all this problem of time disappearing, which is one of the motivations for for our work. And so I would really like to uh, to play some crazy things with gravity. So like uh, create a black hole, uh, create a wormhole, and maybe even create a black hole and put it in a superposition. So that's uh, one of the craziest things you could try to do. It's completely impossible right now, but uh, well, maybe if, uh, if this was really a, a cosmic size lottery, maybe that will give us uh, resources to do that. All right. Well, I think the ethics board might like a word um, before you get into that next experiment. But yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> That look, thank you so much for coming in this evening and sharing that insight. Um, some really interesting stuff, as always, once you dive into the quantum mechanics field, and it's fantastic to see the new ground that you and the team at UQ is breaking. So um, please, everyone, join me in a virtual round of applause for our speaker tonight, Dr. Fabio Costa. And um, we will, of course, be, I said, be back next month. So please sign up to the mailing list and we'll send you all the details and announce our speaker very soon. Otherwise, have a great evening and a great week. I'll see you all soon. Good night. Thank you, everybody.